in field theory, more advanced theory than field theory than we've done so far, what we're about to do, we're about to talk about extension fields, which is kind of strange because with groups and rings, you talk, you don't talk about extension groups or extension rings. You talk about subgroups and sub rings and normal subgroups and ideals. We make it we make the group smaller, so to speak. We look at subsets of it, subgroups of it to understand the bigger group. But with field theory, it turns out to be in general better to extend the field, make a bigger field that contains the field you're starting with. An extension field E of a field F is a bigger field containing E. And the operations in the original field are the same as the operations of the new field, the bigger field, restricted to the original field. What a weird definition. But yes, that's what we're doing is we, we got a field F to start with. And we're saying, does F have a bigger field that it sits in? And the operations in F do match the operations of E if I only think about the, those operations on elements in F. We are talking fields here, right? Not vector spaces. We are coming back to field theory now. Vector spaces are still relevant though, as we will see. So it's a different emphasis. Not that we can't think about subfields. We've already thought about subfields, right? You know, the real numbers is a subfield of the complex numbers. That means the complex numbers are a field extension of the real numbers. As it stands, that doesn't seem like the hardest concept that we've encountered, and it's not, but then it starts getting harder. Because we start relating it to polynomials, for one thing. You might say, well, polynomials are not that hard. Well, yeah, okay. Let f be a field. Let f of x be a non-constant polynomial in this ring fx. Right? Remember, this is a ring. This is not a field. It's a ring that's not. Of course, all fields are rings, but this is a ring that's not a field. The elements are polynomials with coefficients in f. We are adding and multiplying the, com the um, polynomials here in the usual way, but then at the end, you you simplify the coefficient multiplications to make sure they're in the simplest form in F, which often F is ZP. So in that case, you'd be modding by P. The conclusion to this fundamental theorem of field theory is there is an extension field E of F in which F of X has a zero. This is analogous to the fundamental theorem of algebra. What does the fundamental theorem of algebra say? It says any polynomial with real or complex coefficients even, has at least one complex zero. That's the fundamental theorem of algebra. This is somewhat similar, except in a more abstract setting. F is an arbitrary field and E is an extension field of that. But if I thought of F as being the reals and E as being the complex numbers, then this would be relevant for that and would be a special case of the fundamental theorem of algebra. The complex numbers would be an example, or maybe I should say an example that confirms a truth in a sense. E would be the, the field of complex numbers and F would be the field of real numbers. And we'd be talking about polynomials with real coefficients. Proof of that is actually one of the easier proofs in the, in the chapter. Though I'm not saying that means it's easy. I'm not gonna go over it, but it's half a page. And you do need to think about factor rings, it looks like, because we're talking about cosets. Uh, the, the extension field is going to be constructed as a factor ring. There's going to be a maximal ideal, an irreducible polynomial involved. That's going to be the strategy here. Oh, you might say that's a weird strategy, but it's a strategy. All right, here is the real de definition that gave me the most trouble. Splitting field. Let F be a field. I got that picture. And you know, these blobs are not at everything, right? They don't tell you everything about a, a field. We're, we're just seeing set inclusions here, is all. Let A1 through A and be elements of some extension field of that. So the A's are in the bigger field. Does that mean they're, not, they're in E, but not in F? Not necessarily. 
some of the A's or even all the A's in theory could be in the smaller field as well. Though it's more interesting to think about when the A's are not in the smaller field. That's more interesting, more the reason for the definition ultimately. Let F of A1 comma A2 comma through AN denote something. Denote the smallest subfield of E that contains F and this set. It's not, first thing you realize this is not a function, or this is not F of A1 comma A2 through AN as a, some function, like a multivariable calculus function or something. That's the first thing to realize. It has nothing to do with functions, or well, being a function at least. Uh, second thing to realize in looking at the definition, as this is not just going to contain F and just the A's, it's going to contain many more field elements. Yes, it's possible all the A's could be in E, but outside F. And in fact, yes, it's more interesting when they are. This symbol represents, again, the smallest subfield of the bigger field, E. F is the smaller field. E is the bigger field. E is an extension of that. that contains F and the set. So you might think, okay, I guess F of A1 through AN, I set it like it's a function, but it's not a function. Hey, it contains F, all of F, and just these other, these A's. No, it contains many more vectors in it. Can I draw? this thing as the smallest subfield of E that contains F and all these A's? Well, yeah, but that doesn't tell you much besides the fact that it contains F and it contains all the A's. It doesn't tell you much. We do want to understand this thing more. What's the, what's, what's the, what's the motivation for all this as well? The motivation is to try to solve polynomial equations. That's the motivation. We got to get there. But wait a minute, didn't we already talk about solving polynomial equations? Yeah, to some degree, but there's more to say. It is also, this is worth noting, the intersection of all subfields of E that contain F and that set. Think about that intuitively. It's got to be because it's the smallest. If there are other fields, other subfields of E that contain F and all the A's, then this particular one, this notation means take the smallest one, it will be the intersection of all the others. That's worth remembering too. That is to be more particular, if K is any field uh, that contains F and this set, then K, K contains this field. And this is a field, it's the smallest subfield. It's not just a set, it's a field. And that's what the key reason why it contains more than just F and the A's, it contains some other things. Those other things, by the way, are still an E. This purple thing I drew is still a subset of E. In fact, it's a subfield of E. But the fact that it's a, a subfield and not just a subset is gonna mean it's gonna contain other elements besides all the elements of F and just the A's. Finally, to the bane of my existence, the splitting field definition. Let E be an extension field of F. Let F of X be a polynomial in this polynomial ring, coefficients in F. We say that F of X splits in E if there are elements A and F and A1 through AN of E so that we can completely factor F of X. The A1 through AN are elements of E, which again could mean they are elements of F as well, but it's more interesting when they're not. The A, this leading coefficient, so to speak, is an element of the base field. This, this, the field we start with F is sometimes called the base field of the field extensions we're thinking about. And when this happens, we call E a splitting field for F of X over F. 
uh, it, well, if this is true, if E actually equals the smallest. A little confusing, the smallest subfield of an even bigger field that is evidently not called E that contains F and all the A's. If E is the smallest subfield of the even bigger field containing F and all the A's, then we call E a splitting field for F over F. Well, I still have a hard time understanding what this is getting at exactly. Okay, let's start thinking about examples. Start simple, x squared plus one. Start simple with the field two, Q, the rationals. Do you remember we had that theorem? We had some theorems back in chapter 15 that said, for example, every ring with unity has Z as a subfield or Zn as a subfield, depending on the characteristic of the ring. Mentioned that one day, I looked at that. So every ring with unity essentially has either Z or Zn at its core. There was also another theorem in the same chapter that says every field either has a subfield isomorphic to Zp, where P is prime, or the rations. So by thinking about either Zp, where P is prime, or the rationals, we are sort of thinking about the, the ultimate base fields. There's really no other base fields to think about, typically, at the, at the start of the subject, at least. So it makes sense to think of this as an element of Qx. But of course, it's also an element of Zx or Rx or Cx. We know this has no real roots and certainly no rational roots. It's two roots, if we're not thinking about modular arithmetic, are I and negative I in the, the complex plane, the complex field. Square root of negative one and negative square root of negative one, plus or minus I. We see f of x splits in C, but C is not the splitting field for f over the rationals because it's not the smallest field in which f of x splits. This is instead Q of I with parentheses, the set of all complex numbers. I is still the imaginary unit here. It's not an arbitrary symbol. The author doesn't say that, but that's what's meant. Set of all complex numbers where the R and the S, the real and the imaginary part, are actually rational numbers. That is the smallest subfield of the complex numbers that contains all the rationals and contains both plus or minus i in which this polynomial splits. We can factor it completely. Likewise, x squared minus two in Qx has, it does split in the reals, right? As, x squared minus two can be completely factored over the reals as x minus square root of two times x plus square root of two. But the reals do not form a splitting field for this polynomial over the rationals because there's a smaller subfield in which this splits. The smallest one is this one. Q of square root of two. This notation with the parentheses here, by the way, is meant to mirror the notation we just looked at. This notation. This st completely standard notation. I'm not teaching you anything that's not standard notation or standard ideas. This represents the set of all real numbers, I guess, that can be written in this form, r plus s square root of two, where r and s are rational numbers. Yeah, this set does contain more than just the rationals and plus or minus i. It contains, for example, two plus seven i, or five seventeenths minus 
1331st I. It contains, in fact, infinitely many elements beyond those in the rationals and beyond plus or minus I. Same kind of thing happens here. You might wonder, are these really fields? Is QI and Q of square root of two really a field? Let's do the square, Q of square root of two one. This will be the last thing we think about today. Is this thing a field? They're claiming it's the set of all <clears throat> elements that looks like this, all the numbers. Uh, linear algebra connection. It's a set of all linear combinations of the two numbers, one and square root of two. It's a vector space as well. But we're asking, is it a field? It's a vector space. Over what? Over what field? The rationals. Because I can multiply a rational number times this and get something in this form. It's not a vector space over the reals. Because if I multiply an arbitrary real number like times time something like this, I do not get something like this. I, for example, if the real number is pi, it's the A and the B when I after multiplication won't be rational. But yes, the, our main question for the moment is, is this a field? I'm not going to prove it's a field. It, it is. Um, for example, what is the multiplicative inverse of one plus square root of two? Well, even if you were never in an abstract algebra class, I hope you could do this. This means one divided by square root of two. And what's, what, am, what do I need to do to verify this is a field? I need to verify that this number can be put in this form. That's what I need to do. It's not in that form right away. This is going to be accomplished by rationalizing the denominator. Multiply the bottom by one minus square root of two. If you do it to the bottom, you got to do it to the top as well. So you're really not changing the value of the number. If you FOIL out the bottom, one times one minus square root of two, which is one times negative square root of two plus square root of two minus square root of two squared. These two things cancel. You're left with one minus square root of two over one minus square root of two squared is two. One minus square root of two divided by negative one, which can be written as negative one plus square root of two. Hey, that's kind of weird. The multiplicative inverse of one plus square root of two is negative one plus square root of two. Is it right? Well, we can check it. Multiply one plus square root of two times one uh, negative one plus square root of two. One times negative one is negative one. Outside times outside is square root of two. Inside times inside is negative square root of two. Last times last is square root of two times itself is two. Yes, we get one. So these things are fields. Actually, what's a little more mysterious is why is that equality true in the first place, according to the definition of this kind of symbol? That takes proof. Okay. Have a good day. <laughs>